Well, we're at the top of the hour. And uh, now that I have my awesome New Zealand sweatshirt on, let's begin. Uh, let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm absolutely delighted to see so many of you here. Uh, we have an important subject to go through, and I'm really glad to have all of you here with us uh, so we can go through it together. Now, if you're new to the forum, um, welcome. Uh, my name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cat herder. And for the next hour, I'll be guiding you through this conversation, discussion, and exploration. Now, today's session uh, is the last one in a two-month-long string of sessions. The Future Trends Forum, over its history, has explored many, many subjects, everything from the economic sustainability of higher education to open education to women in education. And along the way, we've dealt with many stresses and pressures, but nothing quite like the novel coronavirus pandemic. And this has been hitting colleges and universities worldwide and really reshaping our institutions and the process of post-secondary education. We've been devoting episode after episode, session after session to it. And based on our conversations with all of you, uh, you've said that you would like us to continue it, but you'd also like us to continue reaching out to other topics as well, which we'll do starting next week. But I just want to remind you that uh, we are still in COVID mode. Uh, you can see here the screenshot is from about an hour ago, looking at the global re reach of the pandemic from the Johns Hopkins University site. You can see our total infections officially are closing in on 4 million people, and the death toll is past a quarter of a million people already. The biggest outbreaks are in the United States. So we've been doing a lot of things long to help this. Uh, we've posted a bunch of resources online. Uh, you can go to tinyurl.com slash covidedu to find links to a bunch of those. And I continue to write about this. Today, we're going to host an open discussion. Think of it as a virtual town hall for us to all share and put our heads together, thinking about the impact of COVID-19 on higher education. And as we go today, uh, we don't have a specific agenda. That is, we don't have a specific course of action that we'd like to follow. We want to throw this open to you uh, so that we can hear from you. We'd like to hear your stories and what you've been experiencing as your campus, as you as a professional, or you as a person as well, have experienced during this extraordinary time. We'd like to hear what news stories have struck you or that you think we should be paying attention to. What are the greatest challenges you've been facing? And what are the successes? What tips, strategies would you like to share? Now, helping us in this course of action is a good friend and a good friend of the program and a splendid guest in the past, Maria Anderson. Maria is a wonderful colleague and friend. I, I just want to I, I just say more good things about her than I can for almost anybody else. Uh, Maria is a futurist, so you know that makes her a dangerous person. She's also a beautiful and fantastic math professor who's been teaching math to math phobes and people who struggle with it for years and years. On top of that, she's a founder of a company called Coursetune. So she's a wonderful, wonderful mix of people. And she has a great sense of humor. Um, Maria, I'm so glad you can co-host with us today. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Brian. I'm happy to be here. Well, tell us, first of all, where are you coming from today? Where are you, is that your home base? In, uh, Salt I'm, in, Lake? I'm in Salt Lake. Um, had a beautiful day off yesterday and went into the Uinta Mountains and did some hiking, saw mm. three people. <laughs> So there is some some space to social distance, especially on weekdays. The trails are much more crowded on the weekend. Oh, I imagine. I imagine. Um, and how are you doing? Uh, doing okay. You know, it's it, it's been a really interesting few months for everybody. Um, I uh, I already teach my classes with quite a bit of remote teaching. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I teach as an adjunct for Westminster College, and I. Um, education okay. classes and math classes and I was teaching a teaching with technology class ironically and okay. um, when I'm out of town for a conference or business meeting I teach them remotely yeah. and likewise uh, yeah. if we're in town and a student can't make it to campus for some reason they just attend class remotely using Zoom so we already had all that set up I already had all assignments set up to be nice. submitted digitally you know, and we were well used to having small group sessions remotely. You know, if, if somebody was coming in from away, they would just, you know, be on a computer with a group that had a computer in front of them. Right. So, like, it was interesting because as the whole world kind of 
went into craziness about teaching remotely, my students actually said to me in our first remote, truly remote session, which was just, you know, normal class for us, yeah. they were like, yeah, this was the only class that I figured would be exactly the same as it was before all this happened. And they were right. We made pretty much the only adjustment we made was that the test that I would have proctored in person, I proctored through Zoom and that's it. So um, yeah, that was, uh, so, so that was interesting to watch because for me, that's kind of always been, I think there's so much you can learn from remote teaching that helps students all the time, right. And helps professors all the time to, to keep a closer eye on what's going on. So, uh, I, I'm glad to see everybody, you know, adapting to these things and learning some new things and learning some new tricks that are going to be so helpful for student success when we get back to normal, which may at this point not be till like 2022 two or something, I don't know. Um, uh, but then, you know, I also run a company. And so, you know, we had certainly had a bit of a tumultuous month uh, with mm. every school basically putting all payments on hold uh, mm. as they tried to figure out what was happening to them. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, but we, we um, have pretty smart fiscal policies. So we had a cushion we could rely on and, you know, we were able to apply for the government support. Right. And, um, you know, so we've just been trying to do our best, even though our, our, our company doesn't focus so much on uh, faculty development, we've just been putting out faculty development help and, you know, things that we can do to try to help our clients, you know, weather this storm and get to the other side of it and be ready to start thinking about ironically quality curriculum design. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and we are kind of seeing that uptick again and people uh, saying, like, OK, we think we might need to focus on quality now, <laughs> which is good. Right. Which is great um, for yeah. everybody, which is great for everybody. Yeah. Especially students. Well, then, you know, you've been on the program often enough, both as a participant and as a guest to know that I like to ask people what they're going to be working on for the next year. And uh, I think you just told me uh, what you're going to be working on for the next year. Yeah, I think we're gonna, um, we've been talking about the possibility of trying to get out some systems for uh, helping people to re-navigate the way they um, approach their face-to-face -face classes. Uh, certainly, I think, uh, I always think that having a solid backbone of curriculum design makes it easier to teach everything and easier to pivot on a dime when you need to you if you know what's in your classes if you know how every learning objective is tied to um, learning activities and assessment activities it makes it much easier to you know pull up that design and say all right where do i need to make adjustments given what happened this week right um without that kind of underlying backbone of knowing what's there and how you currently design that curriculum, I, I think it's more difficult. And I think, you know, one of the things that higher ed has always been particularly, I don't know whether the right phrase here is good at or bad at, <laughs> is that um, faculty who, you know, fairly have no actual experience in education, but go on to be teachers, yeah. right? Um, they, uh, they often, you know, teach on the fly right? Because they don't have curriculum background. They don't have curriculum design experience, instructional design experience. And so when you teach in person, you can get away with, you know, like teaching on the fly. I mean, you can get away with it. And that, especially if you have a charismatic personality, if you're the right gender and ethnicity, like your students will forgive most of the kind of crappy things you do in the classroom. Um, but when you're teaching online, you don't really have those same... Um, so same fallbacks uh, as you do teaching on the fly in the classroom. You have to re you you have to design experiences. If you want to have students have aha moments, you have to design that experience instead of hoping right. to see it in the classroom, right? And, and changing, you know, uh, as as the semester progresses. So I'm hoping to see a lot more uh, a lot more quality design and faculty development not just around using technology, but around actual design of learning and design mm -hmm. of assessment. I think this is an opportunity for all of higher ed to kind of have their, 
uh, for lack of a better phrase, their come to Jesus moment on, Mm -hmm. hey, assessment can be more than tests. There's all sorts of variety of assessment we can use. It really should depend on what the learning objective is and how deeply it needs to be learned in the world that we live in today with the information we have access to today. Uh, There's a variety of ways that students can learn things. Um, They don't necessarily have to follow your prescribed path of learning to get there. You probably shouldn't be failing them if they get there. (laughs) You know, I think there's just so much that can happen as a result of this. I I know that um, people, when they teach online for the first time, like in a really well-designed online class that they've built, all of those aha moments that they themselves have come back to their face-to-face classes. Like, oh, I should be doing this in my face-to-face classes too. This is really awesome, right? So yes. I, th- I think higher ed is like fairly criticized uh, for you know not moving very quickly, but I think we've all had a semester where everybody moved a lot quicker than they thought was possible. And maybe that's the only way we really could have kind of given ourselves a fast boot into the future. And it was painful and everybody's exhausted right now that I know in higher ed and everybody is like ready to take a, a, a couple weeks off and that's about all they're going to get before they have to start planning for the next term. If that, yeah. if, I, that, right? if that, I, I have so many questions um, yeah. and, and so many things to ask you. Um, and just before I do that, let me remind everybody here, all 61 of you. Um, hello. Uh, that this is a place for you to ask your questions and uh, to raise your thoughts. So again, just, just scroll down to the, um, uh, raise hand button to join us on stage or just click the question mark if you like type in a question or comment. Um, my one to ask, uh, the, there's so many things you said that are just brilliant. I just want to, I just want to repeat, um, you know, there's the possibility of all of us striving hard to improve the quality of online education. Uh, there's the fact that we are living in a kind of accelerant moment. Uh, you know, higher ed has just been shoved into the future very, very hard and very, very fast. Um, and that that may let us make up for some of the weaknesses in, the, in our operations. Do you think we're going to see a, a, a mass hiring of uh, instructional technologists and uh, educational technologists and instructional designers over the summer? Um, or do you think campuses are right now so shell-shocked and so um, financially stressed that they're basically going to keep the staff they have and work them even harder? Well, like everything else in higher ed, it depends. <laughs> I think one constraint here is that I don't think that it, let's say higher ed decided to hire 3,000 new instructional designers tomorrow. I'm not sure there are 3,000 new instructional designers to hire, right? Yeah. So I think that's one issue. Mm-hmm. I think um, people are discovering they have some budget left for this last academic year. And um, I know that um, several colleagues have seen just an uptick in the desire to have professional development for faculty right now. Mm. Like get faculty, now that we've weathered the initial panic of this, let's get some real professional development to faculty because that ultimately is gonna do a lot more good than hiring one more instructional designer, right? If all the faculty level up, that helps everybody, right? Right. So um, things like professional development for, um, and and certainly every school provided as much as they could right as this crisis was happening, right? But that was panic mode professional development. And now there's time for some more kind of thoughtful, I'm planning ahead, what can I do to restructure my course? like. Uh, that isn't just the keep your head above water. It's the, you know, like, hey, I'd like to be waist deep in this water instead, right? <laughs> and so, um, and I do think that there's, uh, you know, some really good stuff that that can be provided for, for faculty to help. Um, that has been around for a long time, right? But now there's like a, a true desire to um, to reach out and embrace that in a way that we didn't have before. Um, I do think, uh, instructional designers are in high demand um, and are going to continue to be in high demand. I think they're all working really long hours and schools should really think about, you know, yeah. in crisis mode and in the hours that these folks are being asked to work, what yeah. are you doing to help that? Are you providing yeah. something? You know, if it's not pay, is it childcare? Is it, you know, like these, these, these folks are really taking the, the brunt of this and to any school out there who is is also in the midst of moving their LMS during this, I'm so sorry. 
like <laughs> or, or, their, or their ERP system right? or their ERP system or like yeah. oh, of all the semesters this yeah, was uh, not the one to be doing that well I just I, I said this before several weeks uh, ago actually um I just want to just give a shout out to the instructional designers academic technologists who have been working their brains out for the past two months and they get zero publicity for this. Uh, John O'Brien at Educause Review just did a really, really great tribute to them um, because you're not going to see them talked about in, in most locations. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to focus on that question. But before, Maria, I have other questions. Uh, folks have just shared theirs with me, and I, I want to just put a couple of these up here for us to uh, bounce around. Uh, Robert McGuire um, asks, the idea of campus-based courses improving after this experience, interesting. Can you say more? Well, you expect novice online teachers to take back to their classrooms later. And by rubber, I assume by later, you mean once face-to-face uh, -face instruction. Yeah, right? so let, me, let me just give you a really simple example. So a lot of instructors only use a learning management system to post their syllabus and put in final grades because that's all they're required to do. Right. But you can certainly use a learning management system as a Dropbox for assignments and you can um, have students turn in assignments that way, which means that a student, like if you're on a traditional face-to-face -face, you know, offering with very little learning management system involved, you expect students to show up physically in person and hand you their assignments, right? Which means that if a student misses class because of a doctor's appointment, a sick kid, or you know what, the bus was late, whatever, they can't physically hand you that assignment. And if they can't make your office hours, they can't hand it to you there. And right. if you weren't able to get to camp, but if you are now used to accepting those assignments digitally, a student can turn it in even if they were not able to get to campus, right? And so some of these like really simple things bleeding backwards to a face-to-face -face class gives so much more equity to students who may have trickier schedules than others. Um, that that ability to, or that ability for me to say, yeah, I will let you turn this assignment in late, get it to me tomorrow. They can turn it in online, right? And and so like teaching students, like I teach my students how to use a scanning app on the phone, right? From day one, they learn how to scan an, a handwritten assignment and submit it to me, right? Which is often something you need to do in a math or science class with, with a lot of graphs and diagrams. And, and so they know they can do that for anything, like for any of their classes, once you teach it to them, right? As long as the teacher will accept a digital submission, right? right. And on top of that, I think it comes down to this realization that uh, when you teach online, you start to realize that that in-person kind of lecture time that you have, not it's not actually that, like there's a lot of good done by doing this um, online instead, because, um, actually, there was just an article in the New York Times I read today from a student who was a middle school mm -hmm. student in New York, right? She said, I am learning more in this remote teaching time than I learn in the classroom because in the classroom, students are disrupting the classroom all the time. It's distraction after distraction. We don't get through the same material. I don't have time to ask questions. Even when I go to help sessions, there's not enough you know, teachers to do the help. And during the, this time, I can watch the video and I can stop it and rewind it and watch the parts I don't understand again. And there's no distraction from the other students, you know, creating chaos in the classroom. And so you start to have these realizations when you teach online for the first time, like, like, oh, like this is really helpful for students to be able to rewind and rewatch. And if I'm an English language learner, I can read the captions. And that's really helpful because now I can tie this very, you know, specific language to the discipline that I'm reading with the way you say it, which I don't get in the classroom, right? And so teachers start to have these aha moments of their own about what good instructional design actually looks like. And as soon as you have that realization that a video online might actually be a better way to get that information than a professor teaching it over and over in the classroom, that opens up the classroom for more active learning practices, right? So we see tons of this like bleed back from a professor truly learning how to teach online well, and then taking it back into the classroom and reworking everything they do in the classroom. I'd say within about, if an instructor truly goes through and learns how to teach a high quality online class, 
I would say within two or three years, their face-to-face -face classes look very different than they used to. That's a fantastic response, Maria. Uh, I, I'm just tweeting out the uh, article. If you haven't seen it, it's uh, um, by a, a middle schooler named Veronique Mintz. Um, and it's titled, Why I'm Learning More with Distance Learning Than I Do in School. Yeah. Um, and uh, just uh, before I say more, there was a quick comment that came in. I just wanted to share this. Um, this is from uh, Kelly Walsh, College of Westchester, says, observation, we're all seeming to learn how to finally go paperless for the most part. I hope we can sustain that going forward. Definitely, definitely. And we're learning um, how to deliver things without, I mean, students don't often have printers at home. So we're all having to make that adjustment to like, right. uh, you know, no, they can't just come to campus and print something. Uh, <laughs> They yeah. really do have to learn it uh, at home. In, in fact, uh, Kelly wanted to join us on stage. Kelly, uh, would you like to add to that? Sure. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Nice to see you. Yeah, li likewise. And nice to uh, to kind of virtually meet Maria. Um, I just, I had to chime in when you were saying rewind, rewatch, and the use of a video. Um, you know, Brian knows I've been a big advocate of the flipped classroom for many years. Yeah. And um, you were just really hitting some of those key words. And it's so true for, for the potential for instructors to begin to understand the power of short videos and what they can do. And then you, you hit on the other key thing, freeing up class time to use it in a more active learning scenario. So uh, it's going to be really interesting coming out of this to see how, how we embrace blended further and, and the flip as well. Yeah, I think what we're moving into is uh, kind of a more dynamic way of designing our courses and just being, you know, whether we call it flexible teaching, remote. I mean, flexible is, I think, kind of what we're all heading into this fall. Unless your campus has already made a decision that, like, you're fully online, just plan on it being flexible teaching. Like, there's no real other option here. Because even if you have to go to campus and teach your classes in person, you will have students who are still in quarantine somewhere, right? Yeah. And, um, and that's not going to go away. And it's just going to keep coming and going. So you're going to be teaching students who are remote this fall, even if you're not remote this fall. And, you know, you may find that your own health uh, or somebody in your family needs to be quarantined. And even if you're healthy, you're in quarantine. Right. And then you're teaching your class remotely. So yeah. I think we're all going into the fall with this idea that that our design needs to be really flexible and uh, accommodate all of these possibilities. And it's completely doable. This, I mean, like I was saying at the beginning of this, this was already the way I taught my classes, like maximum flexibility for everybody, for me and for the students. Like, however you can come to class, however you can participate, whether it's you're there in person or you watch a video of class afterwards, sure. I'm good with it. Like, my job is to make sure that you learn what you're supposed to learn. That's yep. it. Yeah, and, you know, to add to what you're saying, you know, and put a fine point on it, um, we may be faced with how do we teach a class where some of the students do want to come in because they want to be, you know, we're, we're hearing that. We're not hearing a ton of it, but certainly hearing some students saying, listen, I really don't like this. I want to be in front of my teacher. Teach that class to that student and teach the remote students and so, to some extent do it synchronously because there's something to be said, particularly for, you know, the traditional day student wanting that, those time slots. Yeah, so here's a really interesting twist on that. So I taught a, a math for elementary teachers class this last school year, uh, both semesters. And um, it's a very hands-on class. We do a lot with manipulatives and group and partners and, and things like that. And so uh, my students would act, when I was out of town and teaching remotely, they would actually show up in the classroom. One of them would pull up the Zoom session on the instructor computer, project it to the wall. Hmm. and I would teach them with them all in person and me remote. Yeah. And it worked. We, just we did something similar last spring too. Uh, <laughs> just because it came up coincidentally. Yeah. yeah. And they had all the manipulatives and things they needed for the group activities. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they would pipe up if, if somebody was still, oh, we need another minute, one second. We're still working on this, you know. And I could see kind of like the classroom, you know, if one of them would point their computer at the classroom, then I could see that, right? There's a lot we can do with this. Like, 
Yeah. And I think that a lot of schools are, and a lot of teachers are just starting to scratch the surface of possibilities, but I think there's such great possibilities. I'm so excited to see where we are a year from now in education. I think yeah. you know, if we can all try to be optimistic and um, remind ourselves that in education, we don't tend to do things unless there is a uh, a high state, what I call a high stakes deadline. Like mm -hmm. if we'll be super embarrassed because it doesn't happen. Then suddenly we write the paper, we get the presentation done, we write the syllabus. Like mm -hmm. tend to happen for most of us at the last possible minute. Everybody just learned technology because they had to. Yeah, no, it's quite <laughs> an opportunity. It's going to be a really interesting fall. Yeah. I just I just want to share a quick thought, but then I, I want to ask a question for both of you because you you both be great uh, at this. Um, the quick thought is that um, last year we had as guests the folks who studied the Council of Independent Colleges um, really interesting online education program, which was one where they were doing upper level humanities seminars, team taught or sorry taught across up to a dozen campuses in the U.S. And one of the interesting side effects they found was that the faculty who taught those classes usually teaching online for the first time, found that when they went back to their face-to-face -face classes, that it completely revitalized their face-to-face -face teaching, uh, that they found that in, in literary critical terms, it was defamiliarized. You know, things that they had assumed were now open questions, uh, and they started applying things either directly or indirectly. But the question I want to put to both of you, um, and then I want to get to the more of the questions, because the questions are piling up, which is great, um, is we're talking about optimism. We're talking about you know positive things that could come from this. How do we talk about that and at the same time not sound coarse or callous because we have so much suffering right now? I mean, at all levels, emotional, physical, fiscal suffering, right? I mean, I've been hearing from some people uh, who say we shouldn't talk about um, uh, optimism. We shouldn't be talking about silver linings now. This is not the time to do that. And I, I, I disagree with it, but I keep hearing that and I'm wondering, what you two would say to that charge? I'll let Kelly go first if he has something he wants to say. Thank you, Maria. Um, you know, I, I think I think it's necessary. I think we need to to they belong together, right? These are very challenging situations, and uh, people are suffering all across the spectrum. I mean, uh, I, I, we teach. I teach in West, Westchester, and my college is in New York, just outside of the city. Um, a third of our students have lost their jobs. Uh, uh, Ten percent of them have lost family members. I mean, it is, they're devastated. Um, and we need to accept that, realize it, and we need to look for opportunities to shore everybody up by accepting that reality, not being afraid to hide behind it. Look for this to be, you know, I mean, if, if, if improvements can't come out of challenges and change and challenging times like this, then, I, I, I mean, they, they have to, and, and it's human nature. Um, so... Just, you know, just a few thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I actually just looked at the definition of silver lining and it is a consoling or hopeful prospect. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with looking for silver linings in crises. I think it's very natural to look for silver linings in crises because otherwise you don't have anything hopeful to look towards, right? I think for faculty and instructional designers and academic staff who are so stressed right now, it's good for them to see that something they're learning right now is going to be valuable in the future, that it's not just this sunk, lost time that they're pouring into, you know, this new method of teaching that doesn't have any useful effects post COVID, right? It does have a lot of useful effects post COVID. You will be able to continue to use these strategies. And for all the students who are going through, you know, job losses and family members who are sick and things like that, us being more flexible institutions at the end of this benefits all of them. Because let's say you sign up for fall classes and you start to work and then you finally get a new job and it conflicts with some of your classes. Well, if I can offer you a recording of the classes you would be attending, doesn't that help those students? I mean, isn't that going to benefit all of them when things start to come back online? If they have to go home and take care of a sick family member, yeah. isn't the ability to be flexible going to help them? I mean, this is a huge, huge outcome for higher ed. The ability to stop 
pretending that education is all about the actual time somebody spends in a seat in a classroom and to reframe it around it being more around what are the students supposed to be learning and did they learn it? <laughs> right? I mean, I think I think we to not look for silver linings in crisis and to not look for changes in policies that will help us the next time around would be idiotic. Thank you. Thank you. I knew I could count on both of you. Um, also, I just want to give you this like, uh, um, hmm. uh, I can't remember the right phrase, but you'll tell me once I say it. I think we've all been going through a reality show called Academic Survivor. <laughs> and with every like week that goes by, like you, you, <laughs> there's new lockdown rules, there's new, there's new technology problems. Like, you know, we had the week of Zoom conferences being bombed. That was like the reality right. episode of that week, right? Where we all figured out how to put passwords on meetings mm -hmm. and how to not share our links publicly. And, you know, and every week, you know, like if you if you make it through another week, you're like on to the next episode. So I think we're all to the point now where we can be like, woo, <laughs> we're close to or we're there, right? We survived academic survivor season yeah. one and this summer we go into academic survivor season two and then we're on to uh murder hornets um <laughs> so, uh, Kelly, 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 i just want to say it's nice to see you at home um you've, you've been a frequent guest and a video participant and it's just i was thinking is that really kelly it's like i recognize <laughs> you from your uh from your uh your office thank yeah, you yeah my, thank my music studio looking good Okay, we have a whole stack of questions, and I, I'm, I'm just going to start bringing these up. Um, and friends, if you're new to the forum, you saw how easy it was to pull up uh, Kelly, and you see how easy it is to uh, uh, flow questions. So let me just bring up a few of these and uh, give you a chance, um, uh, again, Maria, to, to grapple with them and for everybody else to pounce, too. Tom Hames, a great friend of the program, asks, "Has have we finally removed the artificial dichotomy between online and in-person classes? No, because I, I think that there isn't an artificial dichotomy. An online class is very different than an in-person class because of the design of the assessments and the design of the learning, right? I mean, we, we can't imagine that these two things aren't actually different. They should be designed differently. I think that what we're removing is this barrier around what is course that that there should actually be a design for courses right uh that we're starting to acknowledge that it is not actually the time in the seats that matters but i don't want to pretend that a, an in-person course is the same as an online course they should be designed differently they are to design an asynchronous experience where people still experience some transformation around their education and still have aha moments in their education is much harder to do than when you can like kind of move around a classroom and in real time uh, poke at students' knowledge of things, right? And so I do think, um, yeah, so yes and no, I guess. Well, no, that's, <laughs> Tom, that's a really good question. And Maria, that's a, that, I love the way you unpeeled that. Um, that's, that's really good. Let's hear it for design. Uh, more questions. Uh, we have one from uh, Patrick Cox at uh, Sage um, who says, uh, in reporting on webinars using COVID during COVID, I've never heard anyone talk about online universities. I know one seeing increased enrollment for fall 2020. No any trends in that sector of higher ed? So I, I'm not familiar with like trends at all schools. I have heard from one school uh, that's quite large that they are expecting um, increases in enrollments because they have a more flexible option for students. Yeah. I think we're going to see that the expensive online options take a hit because everybody's a little worried about their economic circumstances. But I think, um, and I think that for those students who are really wanted the traditional college experience, we might see them stepping out for a year. I, I, they may have unfortunately thought that what they got in their sudden mm -hmm. online remote experience is what online education is. And it's not really. Um, so I think the, the more traditional age students will pull out, but those tr more traditional age students aren't the ones who typically do an online uh, education experience. So I think for expensive schools, they're going to see a drop. This is just my gut feeling. Expensive schools are going to see a drop in enrollment. Less expensive schools, the ones that have a pretty fair tuition rate, 
community mm -hmm. colleges with online programs, uh, four-year schools, with, uh, state schools with online programs, um, uh, competence, some of the competency-based institutions that have affordable degree programs. Those, those I think, might see a bump, especially if, you know, um, financial aid comes through, grants come through, the CARES Act stuff might help with some of that. Um, yeah. We have a couple of strategic questions along those lines, but first I just want to share quickly, uh, Rosemary Wren um, thought the point is to that silveralighting4learning.org has a webinar discussion on this very topic on Saturday. So thank you, Rosemary. Um, I tweeted that out as well. But on the strategic question, uh, Peter Shea at, um, at University of Albany asks this very challenging question. We're seeing estimates that social distancing for classrooms results in a 60 to 70% reduction in seats. Are others grappling with that? I think that there are lots of schools grappling with this, especially because if you're worried about lower enrollments yeah. and you start doing any thinking about what it takes to disinfect a classroom, mm -hmm. uh, you start realizing that your only option during a crisis like this might be to go online because you can't afford what it would take to keep classrooms clean. Like the classroom I teach in, uh, I think the trash gets emptied once a week and the classroom gets disinfected about once a semester, honestly. Now think about the fact that that classroom turns over every one to two hours with a complete new set of students. Even if it's only 50% of the number of students, no. doesn't everything still need to be cleaned between students sitting at those desks? Like yeah. you have to find all that cleaning equipment, which is scarce right now. You yeah. have to pay for the staff to do the cleaning. You yeah. might need more space between classes to do the cleaning. Like yeah. I'm not sure it really makes a lot of sense to attempt to do more than have maybe a couple of scheduled meetings during the semester. And if your students are coming from all over the country, that doesn't even make sense anymore, yeah. right? Because it's, that's just not realistic. So I think what schools are maybe having to to do is um, really convince people that uh, their online offerings can be as high quality as their face to face offerings in the fall, and that they're they're doing things to get ready for that. You just anticipated Peter's follow up question. Okay, let's have it. So, uh, Peter asks, <laughs> um, so how do we bring a thousand plus courses online between now and August? And I, you have to get your faculty trained. Okay, so training the faculty. Yeah, I don't see any other way to do it. You can't possibly hire enough instructional designers to get this done. Your faculty have to be ready. And I think you have to embrace some remote learning as, as a part of that, some synchronous remote learning as a part of that. There is no way to get all online courses designed. And I don't think that your traditional students want that. My students at Westminster love having our in-person sessions. They are happy to be on video with each other. They love being broken into small groups to talk to each other. Like, and they can't always all make those sessions. Sometimes they don't have good internet sometimes, but they can watch them later, right? And so I think that bringing online those courses is making sure that the faculty have uh, good professional development, discipline specific if possible, um, because teaching a Spanish course online versus teaching a um, humanities course online versus teaching a physics course online. How we would design those well is completely different because they really have a different cadence and pace to those courses, right? So if you can get your faculty access to some high quality professional development from an expert in that field about how to teach remotely, how to teach online, um, that's gonna be the best thing you can do. Like. I'm running some Saturday workshops right now um, for STEM folks. And like we come together for a Saturday and we hold sessions like, like it's a workshop, like you went somewhere and did a workshop, right? But we have breaks between the Zoom sessions so nobody gets too burnt out. And, um, and we spend an intensive day like learning all of these different possible strategies with a four week follow up where once a week we meet and do a Q&A about like what people are thinking, what they're trying, like, yeah. you know, what their new uh, questions that have popped to the surface, right? And so that for STEM faculty is 
is really what they need. They need to talk to somebody who's done their subjects online to figure it out. That's the fastest way you can get to scale here. And so I think it's just like deciding how many different pockets you have that need to be trained. Is it like, you know, languages, technical fields, um, softer skill fields, uh, performing fields, you know, like, and then find some professional development that you can uh, get all your faculty into and just be kind of that the hardest thing I think is going to be getting faculty to, to, to step up and do training. Mm -hmm. But I think people are worried enough about being embarrassed by what happens in the fall that again, this is kind of that once in a lifetime opportunity where everybody might show up. Um, if you can't mandate it, at least you can kind of put social pressure on it and uh, get them what they need to be successful. These are our faculty are smart people. If you give if you can get them the resources they need to do a successful job and to really plan for um, a, a successful offering this fall with a variety of activities and, and experiences, I think that that you can be successful. You've got to get them the training and you've got to convince the students it will be different in the fall than yeah. it was this term. It'll be different and better. Um, better. We, we have in a good way. I, I assume it can only be different in a good way at this point. There's well, the bar is set and the bar is not super high. There's um uh, uh one uh Kelly Morrison uh at APUS uh also raised the idea of outsourcing, um, you know, hiring a team like uh, iDesign, for example. Yeah. Um, but I so thank you, Kelly. Um, so we may see more of that. So this might be a good time for that kind of uh, work to be done. But um, I also think that it, if every school out there goes out and tries to hire a team, that that capacity is going to go away pretty fast too. There's only so many instructional designers out there, and so many people who have this expertise. You know, tapping. I would like to say that tapping local instructors at schools, like tapping your own experts to teach the rest of the department would be great. But I almost wonder if you'd be better off finding a sister school and swapping experts. And that's because there's this kind of like, you can't be a prophet in your own land phenomenon yeah. that many of us experience, which is that your de own department may not want to hear what you have to say, but they're willing to listen to what somebody at a different school has to say, right? So finding like a sister college where you could be like, can your expert on teaching business online talk to my business faculty and my expert on teaching business online will talk to your business faculty and everybody will feel like they got something new and like it's, a, it's, a, it's an even trade, right? Um, so, so consider something like that. It really depends on the culture of your college and the culture of the department and only you know what those things are, right? But there are some creative solutions, I think, out there to do this. Great, that's great. I, we have a whole bunch of questions about teaching with technology. Uh, they're, they're more tactical than strategic here. Okay. And I, I wanna bring a few of these up and I, I don't think we can get to all of them because uh, there's so many of them. We'll have to do it again. Friends, the, we'll have to do this again. And, and also uh, I can blog the questions that uh, uh, we don't get to. Um, we have uh, a, a uh, question from John Stites, um, who uh, says so he's preparing to teach this fall on site, allegedly, a class he's already taught twice online. Have you found any tools or strategies that are either on site or online, but not both? So just one and not the other. Um, I think there are some that you do online that would be really boring to do on site. You know, to, to have students go through and watch a video on site would seem a little weird, right? People do uh, that. People what? Do. People yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, so I think like some of the digital, you know, like there are some really great digital tools where students read and answer formative questions as they read, right? That'd be a really weird thing to do on site, I think. Um, I don't know, like I can do most things I would do on site online. Like, I don't know that I can think of something that, mm, I still can't, <laughs> I was trying to think of something that I couldn't do online at this point and I'm not really coming up with anything. Mm -hmm. um, All right, that's okay, we, John, that's, that's okay. Have students practice giving presentations online with each other. I just put them in in uh, small, group, small groups of size two and they take turns okay. presenting to each other for practice. Like, there you go. 
it's actually easier than doing it in person because they don't all hear the other groups and get distracted by it. So right. if you're all in the same room, yeah. I, I don't know. I think it's pretty easy to do things online, but I've been doing it for a long time. And so I think some of it's like, you need people to get comfortable with that. And you know, one of the things I do in Saturday workshops is like, let people practice with things. <laughs> they feel comfortable with it. So they have an experience where they're the student doing all this active stuff online and starting to feel comfortable with like, oh, I know how this works. I know how this feels from the student side. Like, I can a, do this. Yeah. We have a related question from uh, Ruben Puentadura, who's been a great guest in the past. We're going to bring him back uh, about video. Um, and he, he, he points out that um, video is not new. We've, been, we've known about this work starting all the way back in the 1970s. So the question is, how do we introduce all the faculty to this work? Is it more of that uh, peer instruction that you're talking about, having faculty teach each other and swapping instructional designers? I think some of it honestly has to do with um, understanding a little bit more about how learning really happens, uh, which sometimes just happens from teaching online, right? Um, that learning happens when you engage with that video not just because you watched it so learning happens when you like try to do a problem set and you can't figure out a problem so what do you do you go watch the lesson on the problem to figure out what you don't know right it's very rarely i'm going to sit down and watch videos and then i will go do the assignment right in the same way it's not i will sit down and read the textbook and then go take the uh multiple choice quiz that i can take five times no they go take the multiple choice quiz first and if they don't know something, they go back and look at the tiny section of the textbook, right? So I think, um, lear and it, learning has always happened that way. When people were, are sitting in classrooms to assume they've been paying attention to the professor this whole time, like this, the last 50 years, it's kind of a farce, right? Are some of them paying attention? Yes. Many of them don't have the attention span to, to, to pay attention for an entire class. They're daydreaming. Now they're on their phones or their computers, right? Yeah. Um, they're watching what the people next to them are doing in class. Like there's yeah. all sorts of ways they're not paying attention in person. And so um, I don't remember what the question was now, but. No, it's okay. I mean, thinking about, <laughs> thinking about, about teaching, um, teaching faculty how to use video. And again, it's oh. not. It's not just the technical part, you know, we, you know, that's important, but also that we, we've been doing this, we've been thinking about this, we've been practicing. Well, and there are a ton of fantastic video collections out there already, right? So depending on the field and what you want to say, there are plenty of fantastic options for, you know, pulling in content from somebody else and supplementing it with a little bit of your own for like what the discussion is actually about or what the, um, or bringing it into modern times or, or things like that. Like I would have loved to watch the, the Feynman physics lectures when yeah. I took physics, like that would have been a really cool thing to do. Um, and the principle, those basic principles of physics haven't changed much. And, you know, to watch it from somebody who was truly a master at teaching it would have been fun. We have a, a question that's kind of the mere opposite of that. And I want I want to flash this up. And this is from Mark Rush. Uh, at Washington and Lee. Um, and he says, the threat of class recordings being taken out of context means that impromptu aspects of the live class may disappear. No more jokes, for example. I, I wonder about that. I mean, you Okay, so I think that there are um, a couple of things about this. So I don't think that we should take um, live classes and turn them into the permanent online archive for something. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that um, if you're going to make permanent online videos that you need to actually kind of design those, plan them and record them in a separate uh, environment um, from a live class. Uh, they just turn out a little bit better that way. And you don't have to worry about privacy concerns with students answering questions or, or things like that. Um, but with the classes, the classes that you record live, there's a couple possibilities. I think, you know, sometimes the, if I know that one student can't make a live session, I just send the one student that link. If it wasn't something that was like, I'm actually teaching something in this session. If I'm going to actually teach something in the session, I'm probably going to record a video on it for a permanent online experience, right? If it's us discussing things, quite honestly, 
like 50% of my class time is the students working in small groups. I'm not saying anything. So that recording is gets kind of boring if you actually want to watch it. And um, I think that maybe we should have already been thinking about if you wouldn't want somebody to see this in a video, should you be saying it in class? Every student's got a cell phone. Every student's got a video recorder on that cell phone. Even if they're not holding it up, you don't know that they're not recording it at their desk. So if it's something that you wouldn't want repeated to another faculty member, a news show, something like that, then I don't know that you should be saying it in class. Or you should record it in a video that you designed so you can say it exactly the way you want to say it right. so that there's no question what the context is, it yeah. can't be misinterpreted. You can point to the exact source if it comes into question, right? Like, I think that's actually a safer way to go. I've been meaning to do that for some of my, uh, some of the lectures I have to keep giving. Um, uh, speaking of which, we have a, a fan note here uh, from uh, Callie Morrison. She says, you know, there are all kinds of tools like um, Course Tune. That could be <laughs> <up here. laughs> Good yeah. for you. Good for you. I, I think. Uh, oh, Maria, have you have you heard of this thing called the course? Too? But we, uh, friend, we are almost at the at the end of time. So we've got um, we have one uh, one last question, um, which is from Ines Free McKinnon at the University of Wisconsin Stout, uh, and she asks, "What about lab activities like a chemistry lab and field work? How do we teach these online?" Yeah. So I have a ton of ideas about this. Um, one of the things I think faculty can do, so like I've taken every kind of lab, biology, chemistry, physics, engineering. Um, and uh, one of the things that's interesting about a lot of these labs is they're kind of cookbooks if they're not designed very well. And that that's kind mm -hmm. of our default in academia is I will hand you a lab to do, you perform the lab and do the calculations, we call it a lab, right? But interestingly, I think students are asked often enough, why do we do each step of this lab? Like what if if i have several choices here which choice would be the right one to take at this step in the lab right we right. have to monitor and watch the labs instead right that's what we do with our time in lab is make sure nobody blows anything up and make sure everything is safe and well you could record a lab right you could record all the different individual steps of labs with a, a place to ask questions about why steps are happening and what like why you could do them live, you could do them in individual pieces with uh, responses to the, the parts. And then, you know, if you need them to analyze data, you can just give every student a set of data that's their data for the end of the lab, right? It might be good data, it might be somewhat questionable data, they yeah. should know what to do with it either way, right? And don't right. grade them on the quality of the data because you gave them the data, grade them on the quality of the analysis of the data, right? So there's really two things there. There's why do we set up experiments the way we set them up? What is the scientific method? What is, uh, you know, how do we do that? And I. I fear we don't actually do enough of that in lab classes. We focus so much on getting the good data and analyzing it, we kind of skip that initial part. So again, like our silver lining is maybe this is the opportunity to finally address that because we don't have to worry about the safety of 30 or 50 students in a lab setting. We can actually focus on why we do things. like and how we design experiments and what would happen in this experiment if you did this instead of this. Because you don't have to worry that they're gonna actually do it. You just have to find out if they know what would happen if they changed the experiment at that moment, right? So, so, so I think in, that, in a sense, what you're asking for is you're asking for people to talk around the hands-on yeah. work um, and yeah. to explore the intellectual framework around it. Yeah, and certainly mo every discipline has some specific tools where you can have somebody do that recipe-based experiment. But I actually think it's better if we focus on the scientific method of the, the process and the can I do an analysis of the process. And so much of the time, we grade them on the correct data. I'm actually a little more concerned right now whether students can do a correct analysis saying, you know what, this data is no good. I would rerun the experiment. Like Nice. They're, they never get that because they're so afraid their outcomes are going to be bad, right? Sure. <laughs> but if bad outcomes happen in the real world. We should know what to do with them. Well, good outcomes happen 
uh, when you folks ask fantastic questions and we have brilliant people like yourself, Marie, answering them, we're we're just past the end of the hour, so we, we need to stop. I, I, I hate to say it, but Maria, first of all, thank you. Oh, we're going to haul you back. Don't worry. Okay. That's, that's all right. We've got tasers lined up to bring you back. What um, uh, is the best way to keep up with you uh, visiting in this girl on Twitter? Yeah, I see business girl. If you have any faculty who are interested in the STEM workshops we're doing, um, they're all you can sign up for them through Almi Education. And if you're starting to think you want to do some like higher quality curriculum design work, um, we can handle some of the load of bringing in all your data and, and you know, helping you really move forward on that with course tune. So if you haven't seen course tune, um, come come by the website and sign up for a demo and we'll show it to you and, and tell you how we can help you be ahead of this. Uh, for our schools who already were using CourseTune, I think they were a bit ahead of this crisis. They knew a lot more about their curriculum than everybody else. The CourseTune Edge. Um, Maria, thank you so much. You're welcome. So much. We're going to bring you back. Um, but don't go away, friends. Uh, I need to uh, announce some stuff for the next couple of weeks. And I, I want to thank you all for the terrific barrage of questions. I'm going to save these uh, so that we can fling the Maria when she comes back. Um, I just want to say that uh, looking forward uh, over the next few weeks, we have a whole series of guests lined up, uh, and they're going to be talking about a wide range of subjects. Um, we have uh, Sonia Ardoin is going to be talking about student experience. Uh, Jonathan Rothwell is going to be talking about inequality in professions. We have James Lang who's going to be talking about small teaching online, and we have a few more on top of that. So the next month is already being booked up. Uh, if you have other topics or if you have other people that you'd like me to invite, please reach out to me. Um, I'm, I'm always gra grateful to hear that. If you want to keep talking about these subjects, like how to teach with video, how to teach online, how to bring a thousand plus classes online in a hurry, we have all kinds of ways of talking about it between forum sessions. So you can tweet at us at uh, FTTE, use that hashtag, or you tweet at me, uh, Brian Alexander. We have groups on Facebook, groups on LinkedIn. We have a Slack channel. We'd be delighted to hear from you. And in the meantime, if you'd like to go back and look at the 200 uh, recordings, Gonna be 201 tonight. Um, please just head to that URL. Uh, the archive is there waiting for you. Um, and in the meantime, um, we look forward to seeing you next week. I hope you're all well. I know you're all brilliant. Please stay safe. We'll talk to you soon. Bye bye.